Hello students, this is a lecture on dental radiography for weeks 3 and 4. Chapter 11, Dental Radiographs and the Dental Radiographer. A dental radiograph, as you recall, is a photographic image produced on film by the passage of x-rays through teeth and supporting structures. Dental radiographs are necessary component of comprehensive care, and they are essential for diagnostic purposes to enable the dental professional to identify many conditions that may otherwise go undetected. An oral exam limits the practitioner to a knowledge of what is seen clinically. Dental radiographs help to identify conditions that cannot be seen clinically. Dental radiographs are used for detection of disease, lesions, and conditions of the teeth and bones that cannot be seen clinically. It is, they are also used for confirming suspected diseases and assisting in the localization of lesions and foreign ob objects. Subsequent radiographs can be used for comparative purposes. Dental radiographs can minimize and prevent future problems. Therefore, the primary benefit is the detection of disease. The benefit of detecting disease far outweighs the risk of small doses of radiation. Information found on dental radiographs include missing teeth, extra teeth, impacted teeth, dental caries, periodontal disease, tooth abnormalities, retained roots, as well as cysts and tumors. A dental radiographer is any person who positions, exposes, and processes dental x-ray film. The dental radiographer can be a dental assistant or auxiliary, a dental hygienist, or a dentist. It is important that the dental radiography master the knowledge and skills of radiography in order to provide good quality care. Duties and responsibilities of the team include positioning and exposing x-ray films, processing, mounting, and identification of dental radiographs, education of patients, maintenance of darkroom facilities and processing equipment, implementation and monitoring of quality control procedures, and ordering of film and supplies. Each member of the dental team has an important role in the practice. The professional goals of radiography are patient protection, operator protection, patient education, operator competence, operator efficiency, and production of quality radiographs. When the dental radiographer attains these goals, the patient receives the highest quality of care possible. Introduction to Radiographic Examinations Intraoral film is the most commonly used x-ray film. They are used for radiographic inspection of teeth and intraoral adjacent structures and requires the use of an intraoral image receptor. The receptor is placed inside the mouth and is used to examine the teeth and supporting structures. The periapical examination is used to examine the entire tooth and supporting bone and requires a periapical receptor with a paralleling and bisecting technique. The word peri means around. The word apex refers to the end of the root. Interproximal examination involves examining the crowns of both the maxillary and mandibular teeth on one single film. It requires the use of a bite wing receptor and the bite wing technique. 
An occlusal examination is used to examine large areas of the maxilla or the mandible in one film. It requires an occlusal receptor and the occlusal technique. This type of film is most commonly used in pediatric dental offices. A complete mouth radiographic series otherwise known as a full mouth series or FMX, is a full series of complete x-rays of the tooth bearing areas, both dentulous and edentulous. This series can include only periapicals or be a combination of periapicals and bite wings. A total of 14 to 20 films are usually taken. The film size selection is important. These are used to detect disease, foreign objects, retained roots. Patients usually have a full mouth x-ray series taken every three to five years. Diagnostic criteria for intraoral radiographs. Radiographs must show images with optimum density, contrast, definition, and detail. They must show images with the least amount of distortion possible. The full mouth series must include radiographs that show all tooth bearing areas. Periapical radiographs must show the entire crown and root of the teeth being examined, as well as two to three millimeters beyond the root apices. Bite wing radiographs must show open contacts. Extraoral radiographic examination involves the use of panoramic or cephalometric films. It is used for inspection of large areas of the skull or jaws and requires extraoral receptors that are placed outside of the mouth. Prescribing radiographs is based on the individual needs of the patient. A full mouth series is appropriate when a new adult patient presents with clinical evidence of generalized dental disease or a history of extensive dental treatment. Normal anatomy, intraoral images. Cortical bone is also referred to as compact bone. It is the dense outer layer of bone that appears radiopaque on a radiograph. Cancellous bone is the soft, spongy bone located between two layers of dense cortical bone. It appears primarily radiolucent with trabecula that appear radiopaque and marrow spaces which appear radiolucent. The inferior border of the mandible is composed of cortical bone. Definitions. The prominences of bone are referred to as either a process, which is a marked prominence or projection, a ridge, which is a linear prominence or projection, a spine, which is a sharp, thorn-like projection, a tubercle, which is a small bump or nodule, a tuberosity, which is a rounded prominence. Spaces and depressions in bone are referred to as a canal, which is a tube-like passageway through bone that contains nerves and blood vessels, a foramen, which is an opening or hole that permits the passage of nerves and blood vessels, a fossa, which is a broad, shallow, scooped out or depressed area in the bone, and sinus spaces, which are hollow spaces or cavities or recesses. Miscellaneous terms are a septum, which is a bony wall or partition that divides two spaces or cavities, and the septa are radiopaque. A suture is an immovable joint representing a line of union between adjoining bones in the skull. These show up as a thin radiolucent line. A septum may be present within the space of a fossa or a sinus. Bony landmarks of the maxilla. 
the upper jaw is composed of two paired bones, the maxilla. The paired maxilla meet at the midline of the face. They form the floor of the orbit of the eye, the sides and floor of the nasal cavities, and the hard palate. The incisive foramen, an image is seen on the right, is an opening or hole in the bone that is located at the midline of the anterior portion of the hard palate directly posterior to the maxillary central incisors. Radiographically, it appears as a small, ovoid, or round, radiolucent area located between the roots of the maxillary central incisors. The nasopalatine nerve exits the maxilla through the incisive foramen. The term foramen refers to a hole. Median palatine suture. The palatine processes form the major portion of the hard palate. The median palatine suture is the immovable joint between the two palatine processes of the maxilla. The median palatine suture extends from the alveolar bone between the maxillary central incisors to the posterior hard palate. It appears as a thin radiolucent line between the maxillary central incisors. The lateral fossa is a smooth, depressed area of the maxilla located just inferior and medial to the infraorbital foramen between the canine and lateral incisors. It appears as a radiolucent area between the maxillary canine and lateral incisors. It is also known as the canine fossa. The appearance of the lateral fossa depends on the patient's individual anatomy. The nasal cavity is also known as the nasal fossa. The lateral walls of the nasal cavity are formed by the ethmoid bone and the maxilla. The nasal cavity is divided by the nasal septum. It appears as a large radiolucent area above the maxillary incisors. The nasal septum is a vertical bony wall or partition that divides the nasal cavity into the right and left nasal fossa. Formed by the vomer and a portion of the ethmoid bone and cartilage, it appears as a vertical radiopaque partition that divides the nasal cavity. The floor of the nasal cavity is composed of dense cortical bone and defines the inferior border of the nasal cavity. It appears as a dense radiopaque band of bone above the maxillary incisors. The anterior nasal spine is a sharp projection of the maxilla located at the anterior and inferior portion of the nasal cavity. It is a V-shaped radiopaque area located at the intersection of the floor of the nasal cavity and the nasal septum. Inferior nasal concha. This is a wafer-thin, curved plate of bone that extends from the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Conca means shell-shaped or scroll-shaped. It appears as a diffuse radiopaque mass or projection within the nasal cavity. The maxillary sinus. At birth, the maxillary sinus is the size of a small pea. The maxillary sinus is composed of dense cortical bone. They appear as radiolucent areas located above the apices of the maxillary premolars and molars. The inverted Y is the intersection of the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity. It appears as a radiopaque upside down Y formed by the intersection of the lateral wall of the nasal fossa and the anterior border of the maxillary sinus. It is located above the maxillary canine. 
both the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and the anterior border of the maxillary sinus are composed of dense cortical bone. The maxillary tuberosity is a rounded prominence of bone that extends posterior to the third molar region. It appears as a radiopaque bulge distal to the third molar. Blood vessels and nerves enter the maxilla in this region and supply the posterior teeth. The hamulus is also known as the hamular process. It is a small hook-like projection of bone extending from the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. It is a radiopaque hook-like projection seen posterior to the maxillary tuberosity area. The radiographic appearance of the hamulus varies in length, shape, and density from person to person. The zygomatic process of the maxilla is composed of dense cortical bone. It is seen as a J or U-shaped radiopacity located superior to the maxillary first molar region. The zygoma is also known as the cheekbone, malar bone, or zygomatic bone. The zygoma is composed of dense cortical bone. It articulates with the zygomatic process of the maxilla. In the image to the right, number one points to the floor of the maxillary sinus, two, the maxillary sinus itself, three, the zygomatic process of the maxilla, four, the zygoma, five, a septum in the maxillary sinus, six, the lower border of the zygomatic arch, seven, the hamulus, eight, the maxillary tuberosity, and nine, the coronoid process. The body of the mandible is the largest and strongest bone of the face. It is divided into three main parts. The ramus, which is the vertical portion found posterior to the third molar. The body, which is the horizontal U-shaped portion from ramus to ramus. And the alveolar process, which is the, the portion of the bone that encases and supports the teeth. The genial tubercles are tiny bumps of bone on the lingual aspect of the mandible. This is an attachment site for the genioglossus and geniohyoid muscles. The genial tubercles are also known as mental spines. The radiographic appearance is a ring-shaped radiopacity below the apices of the mandibular incisors. The radiolucent spot in the center is the lingual foramen. The lingual foramen is a tiny hole in bone located on the internal surface of the mandible. It is located near the midline and is surrounded by the genial tubercles which appear as a radiopaque ring. Nutrient canals are tube-like passageways through the bone which contain nerves and blood vessels that supply the teeth. They are most often seen in the anterior mandible. Vertical radiolucent lines are readily seen in the thin bone. The mental ridge is a linear prominence of cortical bone located on the external surface of the anterior portion of the mandible. They appear as thick radiopaque band that extends from the premolar region to the incisor region. It often appears superimposed over the mandibular anterior teeth. The mental fossa is a scooped out, depressed area of bone located on the external surface of the anterior mandible. It appears as a radiolucent area above the mental ridge. 
The mental foramen is an opening or hole in bone located on the external surface of the mandible in the region of the mandibular premolars. It appears as a small ovoid or round radiolucent area located in the apical region of the mandibular premolars. It is frequently misdiagnosed as a periapical lesion. The mylohyoid ridge or mylohyoid line extends from the molar region downward and forward toward the lower border of the mandibular symphysis. It may appear continuous with the internal oblique ridge. It appears as a dense radiopaque band that extends downward and forward. This is the attachment for the mylohyoid muscle. The mandibular canal is a tube-like passageway through the bone that travels the length of the mandible. It houses the inferior alveolar nerve and blood vessels. It appears as a radiolucent band outlined by two thin radiopaque lines that represent the cortical walls of the canal. The mandibular canal extends from the mandibular foramen to the mental foramen. The internal oblique ridge is also known as the internal oblique line. It is a linear prominence of bone located on the internal surface of the mandible, mandibular ramus. The appearance is a radiopaque band that extends downward and forward from the ramus. When both the external and internal oblique ridges appear, the external ridge is superior to the internal ridge. The external oblique ridge or external oblique line extends from the anterior border of the ramus and ends in the external oblique ridge. It typically ends in the mandibular third molar region. It appears as a radiopaque band extending downward and forward from the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. The submandibular fossa is a scooped out, depressed area of bone located on the internal surface of the mandible inferior to the mylohyoid ridge. It appears radiolucent. The submandibular fossa is also known as the mandibular fossa or submaxillary fossa. The submandibular salivary gland is located in the submandibular fossa. The coronoid process is a marked prominence of bone on the anterior ramus of the mandible. Radiographically, it appears as a triangular radiopacity superimposed over or inferior to the maxillary tuberosity region. The coronoid process serves as an attachment site for one of the muscles of mastication. Tooth structure can also be seen in radiographs. Enamel which is A in the radiograph, is the outermost radiopaque layer of the crown of the tooth. Dentin is labeled B in the radiograph and comprises most of the tooth structure. It is not as radiopaque as enamel. The dentino-enamel junction is labeled C in the image and it is the junction between the dentin and the enamel. The radiolucent area in the center of the tooth is the pulp cavity. Lamina dura is the wall of the tooth socket, which is made of dense cortical bone. It appears as a dense radiopaque line that surrounds the root of the tooth. The alveolar crest. In the anterior region, the normal alveolar crest appears pointed and sharp between the teeth. 
The alveolar crest is a dense radiopaque line in the anterior region. In the posterior regions, the normal alveolar crest appears flat and smooth between the teeth. The most coronal portion of the alveolar bone found between the teeth is the alveolar crest. Periodontal ligament space is the space between the root of the tooth and the lamina dura. It is seen as a thin radiolucent line around the root of the tooth. This concludes this section on dental radiography.